My name's Paul Hopewell. Welcome back to my shed. This is where I make all sorts of stuff, usually for old classic motor vehicles or machines, and I show you what I went through to finish the project. Having used the square tool post holder in the South Bend lathe and a range of tools it can hold, it couldn't hold a bunch of old style tools that I found at a garage sale. These old style tools were probably used on this machine when it was new and to use them I wanted a lantern style tool holder to hold them. Now I'm sure that in many countries these lantern style tool holders are available in every high street store and online auction sites are asking far too much for this stuff nowadays. I bought these tools as a job lot and would like to use them on my South Bend lathe because they're easier to reshape and resharpen, quite easy to reset, and the high speed steel inserts are also cheap to buy. In this video I show you how I made the lantern style tool post using material from an old drive shaft and some mild steel plate and bar cut off. I've a reasonable idea of what I need to do, but I haven't any drawings beyond what I'd scribbled on the whiteboard. Most of what I did on this project was ad hoc, so to speak. To start with, I had an old van drive shaft begging me to use it for something, so I took six inches off of that and a bit of two and three quarter inch bar to make the round bits. The rest was cut from a bit of 20mm flat mild steel plate. This bit of 45mm drive shaft bar is quite hard stuff and I already knew at this point that turning it was going to be a challenge. After end and centering it I reset it in the chuck allowing me to machine most of the external dimensions in one operation. The scratch mark was set to 125mm 5 inches from the end, where I set the hand wheel to zero signifying the shoulder to the base of the post. The tool openly protested at having to cut this material, so I shoved the tool deeper into the holder and gave it a bit more to complain about by increasing the depth of cut by another tenth thou and gave it a few more revs. The finish was nice, but that's no good. I'm only removing the skin, so I changed the insert for a more positive rake insert. This allowed me to take 2mm off the diameter at a time. The swarf was a bit stringy and when I put the rule up to check that it had stopped cutting at the right place, I couldn't help but notice that the material was just a little bit warm. That prompted me to give the suds bottle a bit of something to do. At this point I was going to have to change tools because the back of the tool was going to hit the tailstock if I didn't. I opted for a 12mm TCMG with a 1.2mm rad tip and I took three equal cuts down to size. On the first cut I altered the speed to find the optimum speed for the best finish rather than calculate it. The size I was after was just short of one and a quarter inches to allow a little free play through the T-slot. And after struggling to free the square tool post when I first got the South Bend lathe, I thought it best to leave a bit of free play. I chamfered the top to about 45 degree and then I altered the chamfer a little more to add a small decorative finish. After taking the material out of the chuck, I quickly ambled down to the bandsaw and lopped off the excess material. A few cuts across the bottom face brought the retaining shoulder to a quarter inch thickness. This was as much as I needed to do to the post at this time. Picking up the bit of two and three quarter sawn off at one inch long, this was eventually to become the concave washer. And like the post, I left more material on it to help with the machining process.
Now this was the tricky bit. I needed to scallop out a concave section in the centre of this rather thick washer and to hold it I used my rather cumbersome universal indexing chuck. Why do I want to scallop out the washer? Well, it works in conjunction with the tool support. When finished, it aids the tool positioning in respect to the centre height, reach and approach angle. In short, it allows the cutting edge of the tool to be quickly positioned just about anywhere within the vicinity of the tool post. This piece here is the tool support. It'll be machined later. The outside of this washer or puck has not been machined and I didn't intend to machine it unless it was necessary. As the outside of the puck was a bit rough, I swept the indicator across the outside of the jaws. This was to set the puck directly under the cutting tool. The cutter was a fly cutter with a single high speed steel ground tool. At this point I was a bit out of my depth. I'd never cut a concave scallop out of anything. I have machined spherical bores for self-aligning bearings, but not dishes or parabolics. So I figure what could possibly go wrong? I chose an arbitrary angle in the universal indexing chuck of about 60 degrees and I figured that I wanted a maximum depth within the scallop to be about 6 to 8 millimetres deep. I also figured that the fly cutter needs to sweep across at 30% bigger than the scallop is going to be wide. I hope you got that, because as I said this bit is purely guesswork. I spent a bit of time chewing my gums and oiling stuff, slightly fearful of the impending doom should the excrement hit the fan. Yeah, I know about this missing pinion. When I get time I'll make one. Maybe after I've made the steady rest and the follower rest. It seems I've still got plenty to do. Well, I had to bite the bullet and get on with it. One thing I had figured is that the axial centre of the washer is at 30 degrees to the tool's axis. That meant that as the cutter progressed deeper into the scallop, it will leave a conical pip at the centre of the scallop. To combat this, I'll have to move the table towards the tool as it progresses downwards. And at this point, if everything went according to plan, the scallop should produce a beautifully curved dish. Yes, I'm, I'm wearing gloves. It's that or wear some burn cream. Well, it worked. Now to make the convex tool support. This item is the interface between the tool and the dished washer. This washer will soon have a one and a quarter inch board hole through it to accommodate the tool post. But before I drill through this puck, I need to know the radius of this curve and the cord across the curve. This is where I had to do some maths. This is a cross section of the puck that is to become the concave washer. The cord is 68 millimetres and the depth at the centre is 7.88 millimetres. With the cord being 68 millimetres across, the span halfway across is 34 millimetres. And with this I need to calculate the radius of this arc. To do this, I square half of the span. So 34 times 34 equals 1156. 1156 divided by 7.88 millimetres equals 146.7. 146.7 plus 7.88 equals 154.58. That'll be the diameter. 
Divide this figure by 2 and you arrive at 77.3-ish. Now all I need to do is to sort out how to cut that convex tool support. This is what I came up with. Using the South Bend faceplate, I could just hold the material using small milling clamps. When secured, they just managed to remain inside the intended radius. I've also added a sacrificial piece opposing the required material. This sacrificial dummy does two things. One, it provides an opposing machined face with which to take an accurate measurement and two, it provides a counterbalance with the workpiece. And being on a surface plate means that I can take the whole lot off with ease, enabling me to better measure across the workpiece and sacrificial dummy should I need to. Now, I'm not too proud of my decision to use a bit of thin marine ply as a packer here. It didn't move, but I couldn't really be sure that the material was going to be as square as it could be, so I changed the packer for a bit of flat brass bar. Because of the backlash in the back gears, the intermittent nature of this type of cut leads to a great deal of clatter while the cut is in progress. What I did just out of camera shot was to apply a small amount of braking force to the chuck's outside circumference using a bit of wood. This drag was enough to let me hear the cut and more to the point when the sound of the cut changes signifying the end of the tool run. Now with that done I could offer the partly machined tool support into the puck. The radius was perfect. Oh. The width of the support was such that looking closely you can see that only the sides of the support was in contact with the curve. And because I couldn't figure out a safe way to machine a concave support to comfortably fit the puck, I resorted to an old and trusted method. Elbow grease. I hadn't got my thinking cap on when I started to scrape this tool support because I kept on taking the material out of the vise to check progress. This was a much better way of doing it faster too, but the whole process still took quite some time. I also had a bit of a brain fart here too. When I put this tool support in the milling vise, I purposely tipped the workpiece up on one end. My thought was, if I want a tool to tip over to a larger angle for some reason, the end of the support would ride inside the curved face, and possibly mark it. So I thought if I made one end thinner than the other end, then I could reduce this possibility. However, the reality is, yes, it would make a difference, but it was hardly going to make much of a difference. Anyway, after that little digression, the width of this tool support needed 2mm off each side, so I whizzed up and down both sides removing no more than 1mm at a time.
As I was already using the mill, I thought I'd get on with the tea nut next, and as usual, it had to be squared and generally roughed out. Most of the machine work to this tea nut is self explanatory, so while you watch this, I'll play some music in the background. Only joking, you'd probably fall asleep, so I'll keep yakking at you. Both sides of this tea nut were milled to just short of one and three quarter inches to ensure that it slides with a little bit of free play, hopefully to prevent any trapping should the tea nut get a bit distorted. Next I milled the overall thickness to 0.6 of an inch. This leaves a little of the tea slot exposed should I wish to make a different type of adjustment washer in the future. When the tea nut height was finished I concentrated on the remaining tea nut features. I wanted the central body of the tea nut to be a tad under one and a quarter inches, which ideally 1.240 inches would do. After a touch of fettling and a test fit, the tea nut was put back into the mill to tidy up both ends. Without too much messing about with the milling vise, I put the main tool post in to start the tool slot. Using my homemade centre finder, I snook up to the larger diameter on the tool post and set the index marker to zero and rechecked the setting. Then on the other side I followed the same procedure but instead of zeroing the dial I simply marked the position with a pencil and rechecked the mark. After that I calculated the halfway position from the zero mark and set the central y-axis position over the toolpost. To set the x-axis I fitted a 3mm drill bit into the milling collet and freewheeled it next to the tool post's base flange. The flange had a single ply of wet tissue stuck to it, no glue, just water was holding the paper in place. As the drill was about to touch the workpiece the tissue was pulled through and the x-axis was set. I added 16mm and then subtracted one and a half and then added a further 8mm, a total of x plus 22.5mm, and zeroed the x index wheel. This position is the setting for the first 16mm cutter. I drilled the first 3mm hole through, then indexed to the next position, and so on. Here I changed the 3mm drill for a 15mm drill, and reset for a rerun. Except that I decided to drill only the two end holes and the centre one. I don't want to break my drill bit. Next up was the 30mm roughing end mill. I used this to rough a slot through the tool post and then skim down both sides of the slot to prepare for the next tool. The next tool was a 16mm four flute end mill cutter. This tool cleaned up the slot just nicely.
After cleaning off all the burrs, I quickly tried the tool support through the slot. My next job was to remove the excess material from the bottom of the pulp. After a bit of measuring and an equal amount of guesswork, I deduced that I needed to remove 7mm off the bottom face. So I skimmed down the OD by 7mm, then I ran over the face several times to remove the unwanted material. Having satisfied myself that I'd removed enough material, I started the drilling process. Starting with the centre drill, then straight on with a 25mm drill followed by a 30mm drill, and then finished off with the boring tool to size. After a bit more fettling I tested the fit before going any further. Happy as I could be with the progress so far, it remained for me to do the next operation on this tool and it was drilling and tapping the main tool post for the clamping bolt. I was tempted to use a metric threaded bolt, but out of the corner of the workshop a lone bolt of a suitable size and length hailed to me. Actually, as I was reaching for a 14mm bolt, I knocked the lin bin of old Imperial bolts on my left boot. It was while I was clearing up the plethora of old bolts, one looked too good to miss, so I used it. It's a half inch BSF by 16 TPI at 4 inches long. Just right. So I set it up and drilled the hole to 10.7 for a half inch BSP tap. I do hate upsetting the three-jaw chuck just to use the four-jaw chuck for one operation. That's why I built this quick-fit four-jaw system, and I love it. The T-nut is the last item on this toolpost project. I put it in the four jaws and set it up with a sticky pin. I've had this sticky pin for many years. My sticky pin is a welding rod minus the flux. One end is bent in a U-shape, and the other end is sharpened on a grindstone to a point. To that, a large dollop of plasticine is moulded around the hooked end. This seemingly innocuous tool will stick to anything and will point at any direction. It's a great little tool for setting up rough castings against a known surface. I've replaced the plasticine a few times and it's a good tool to have in the toolkit. I set up this T-knot using the pin, but before I finished boring it I used a bore micrometer to confirm how good it was. It was only six thou out and it wasn't really worth worrying about. I see many videos of fellow machinists from what might be called third world countries, and I truly give them the greatest respect for what they can achieve with a busted lathe, a carbide tipped bolt and a bit of wire. Anyhow, after setting up the workpiece I drilled it with a 10mm drill followed with a 25mm drill. This drill is on an arbour making it quite long and unstable, especially at the beginning of the cut. After drilling and much use of the boring bar I achieved the required size, one and one quarter inch. The tool post was used as the checking gauge. I didn't use the sticky pin to set the second side to this T-knot. I'm OK with sticky pin generally, but I'm not that good. All I have to do now is machine the recess to accept the quarter inch thick by one and three quarter inch diameter flange on the tool post. The final fettling was completed off camera. For the final fit, the tool post is fitted to the T-knot and slid into the T-slot. And the concave washer was placed over the top with the concave side upwards. Next, the tool support is fitted inside the tool post slot and onto the washer with the flattest side upwards. Cutting tool is then inserted into the tool post slot and the securing bolt is nipped up.
As a special treat, I found an old 716 Whitworth spanner with War Department markings on it. This spanner will be the spanner that I'll use to lock this half-inch BSF bolt into place. After setting it on the centre line. Just to prove it works, I plunked a spare bit of tube into the three-jaw chuck and tightened it up. The feed was set to 24 thou by 20 thou deep. Then later another cut was taken at 15 thou feed and 24 thou deep. The tool I used wasn't sharpened, it was just one that was in the holder. I hope you enjoyed this video, thanks for watching, bye for now.